Hello and welcome to the OMFIF podcast. Uh, my name is Lewis McClellan. I'm the editor of the Digital Monetary Institute here at OMFIF. And today uh, we're going to be discussing the crypto industry uh, and the effects on the crypto industry from the US election. Uh, it won't be a surprise to anyone to, to know that that's been uh, absolutely seismic so far. Bitcoin is at all time highs, over 90,000. Uh, and by the time you listen to this, we'll uh, probably be even higher. Actually, that's definitely not investment advice. Don't don't buy uh, based on that. Um, uh, but yeah, the, I think it's fair to say that this is uh, the first major election cycle in the US where uh, crypto policy has been a serious plank of, uh, in, in some ways, both candidates' platforms. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the effects are already being seen. So uh, fortunately, I don't have to talk about this alone. I'm joined by uh, some real experts on this topic uh, who work in the industry and are exposed to uh, a lot of um, a lot of the effects that that we're kind of looking ahead to to analyze so um, I'll let them introduce themselves uh, Dorothy would you like to go first Hi, my name is Dorothy DeWitt and I want to thank Lewis and Omfif for having all of us on and um just as a brief background, I've uh, been uh, in trading and markets for a long time. Uh, somewhat recently, I worked at Citadel Securities. Then I joined as general counsel at Coinbase. I then became the uh, division director of the Division of Market Oversight, the largest policy division that oversees all of the exchanges and also oversees market changes and emerging risks like new like for new, new types of markets, like a new market structure as it develops, like crypto and, and prediction markets and other things. And one of the things I was most proud of during my time at the CFTC is, along with some other experts, helping the 700 person commission really understand crypto so they could get to the level that they needed to be and that, you know, they're well beyond that now. Um, afterwards, uh, after I left the CFTC, I did a six month stint in the Senate. Uh, developing uh, bipartisan legislation, uh, working as uh, chief finance counsel for Senator Gillibrand. And the purpose of that was exclusively to uh, develop policy, bipartisan policy around cryptocurrency and payment stable coins. I now run my own company that is a consulting company that specializes in um, providing innovative solutions to emerging industries. That company is called Tolt Strategies. Fantastic. Thanks, Dorothy. Uh, Suzanne? Hi, everyone. I'm Suzanne Morsefield. And again, thank you as well, uh, Tomfa, for gathering all of us. Um, look forward to talk with everyone about these topics. Um, I should do a disclaimer at the front that um, the obvious one that these are my views and not the views of any of my current past or future employers. And I also happen to be wearing a bright red uh, blouse, which is not wardrobe advice or political advice. It is just what I happen to wear today. Um, my background is uh, also in tradition, a lot of traditional um, finance background and traditional accounting and tax background. I'm a PhD in accounting and tax and serve uh, has been serving as the global head of accounting and tax solutions for Luca, which is a data and software company um, in the crypto industry. Um, I also serve as a policy advisor for Crypto UK, which is a, a UK centric, obviously trade organization. And I'm looking forward to talking about perhaps some of the cross, cross the ocean sort of effects of, of some of what's going on in the US as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Suzanne. Great to have you. Anna and Brian. Hi. Thanks, Lewis. And also a pleasure to be here. Um, Brian Whitehurst, I'm the head of regulatory affairs and regulatory counsel at Luca uh, as colleagues with Suzanne of uh, enterprise data management and uh, software solutions for anyone that has crypto assets on their books. Um, prior to joining Luca almost two and a half years ago, I spent 12 years at the New York Attorney General's office doing securities and commodities fraud litigation, the last five of which were all in the digital asset space. I, I started, for lack of uh, lack of a better word, the, the uh, digital assets practice there at the New York Attorney General's office um, was the lead on such things as the Tether investigation and, and BlockFi and a, a number of other things throughout the years. Um, at, at Luca, I spend a lot of my time speaking to global regulators to kind of see how they're, how they're developing their frameworks uh, for digital assets and what they're doing globally and how they interact with other regulators and spend quite a bit of time down in D.C. Uh, doing the same. 
Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Well, it's great to have you all. I mean, I think we've got a really good balance here. We've got uh, some litigation experience, some accounting, some some regulation and, and legislation uh, backgrounds. Uh, so, uh, well, with that out of the way, let's uh, let's get uh, straight into it. Obviously, we've seen a huge boost to uh, crypto asset prices following Trump's election. Um, would that have how much of that is tied to Trump and his policy platform? I mean, obviously, in some ways, you know, you wait for just clarity. And I think that's that we've seen some of that in traditional assets and maybe it would have gone gone similarly either way. So just how different were the candidates on this and how much of what we're seeing now is a reflection of what people are are expecting from from the Trump administration? Uh, I'm gonna, um, yeah, Brian, please. Sure. Yeah. Well, I just begin. I. I think you would have seen ultimately a, a bump from either candidate with either either candidate winning. However, I think you the more immediate and larger bump was going to always happen with Trump. Um, there was going to take some a bit more time, I think, with Harris had she won because she was not as clear um, <laughs> with what she thought about the industry uh, during the campaign uh, season. Uh, so I think ultimately it would have come down. Her bump would have come from her decisions during the transition period and if you know if, for instance if gary gensler would have stayed as uh chair of the sec um and other decisions that she could have made along the line but ultimately i do think you would have seen a bump either way uh just a much bigger bump with trump i would also add uh that uh really I agree with uh, what Brian said, but really the, the trifecta is what gives the biggest bump that you have for for the crypto industry. That is uh, President Trump winning the presidency and Republicans winning both the House and the Senate. So that is really what enables um, legislative solutions around cryptocurrency, many of which have been proposed in the last session, but were really lacking in Democrat support. Uh, with some a few exceptions, including the time that I spent on the Senate with Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who who co-sponsored the Gillibrand Lummis bill, but you know, you know, now that Republicans have control of both the House and the Senate, um, they are able to move the legislation forward uh, that can do a couple of things. Excuse me, that can do a couple of things. The first thing it can do is it can expand the CFTC's jurisdiction to the spot crypto market. The CFTC's never had spot market jurisdiction. And you would think traditional Republicans would want to restrict jurisdiction, generally speaking. But crypto is unusual in a lot of ways. And crypto wants to be regulated. The industry wants to be regulated. It's been asking to be regulated. So Congress can more quickly pass legislation, whether it's re related to the current what was proposed in the current session that's about to expire. It'll need to be reintroduced or maybe something slightly different. Uh, but that trifecta is really important for the crypto industry and the crypto industry is cheering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could yeah. add one yeah. really just little point to that from, it's kind of from the academics world, which is what, what, it, what drives Bitcoin valuation in particular. So we've got decades and decades of understanding what drives um, and growing and understanding what drives equities markets, but, but, Bitcoin in particular and crypto, we have less understanding of. Having said that, there's some good academic research that's really starting to, to come out that indicates it's mainly sentiment at the moment, right? So because you don't have an underlying necessary thing that it has built or is, you know, is, is building on. It's not got a widget behind it per se, though we could argue about that. But it's sentiment. And going back to both Brian and Dorothy's point, there's there's a lot of positive sentiment now that has really come forth. And it's come forth because of the election and because of the trifecta, I think, is a, is a really sort of nice way to kind of get our arms around that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, I, I want to come back to the the legislative action that, that you referred to, Dorothy, in a moment. But uh, I just before that, there, there's another component which I think is worth asking about, and that is the regulatory side of it and the the possible change in personnel. Uh, I think it's no secret that you know Trump, I think, in in his campaign said firing Gary Gensler at the top of the SEC was was a day one task. Uh, I don't know if it'll actually pan out like that, but we're certainly expecting uh, a change in um, in personnel at some of the top regulators, uh, and yeah, how is that going to play into the 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 approach, and and is that being factored into uh, what we're seeing in crypto asset prices? 
All right, do you Dorothy, want to go you first? Wanna... <laughs> uh, you, you, ladies first. You first. Is fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, let's start with the easiest to the hardest, and then throw in a couple complications. But I, I'll cover just a little of it, and maybe come in at the end if there's more to cover. So I don't, you know, don't don't go too far. Under the Biden, under President Joe Biden, banking regulators have effectively precluded digital assets from being integrated into the banking system. And the SEC has applied a regulation through enforcement approach uh, uh, strategy to blockchain related enterprises. And both of those approaches under the new administration are, 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 are approaches that the new administration may or indeed are very likely to curtail or reverse. Regulatory change is slow, uh, although there is something called the Congressional Review Act that can be a little faster, uh, where Congress in session can um, repeal recently finalized uh, legislation. We can go into that in more detail if you like. But we do expect that those things will change. There is sort of a big wild card, and this is the wild card that relates to the prior comment of where crypto is sort of counterintuitive in some ways. It's an industry that wants more regulation, whereas most other industries like um, energy and others might want less regulation. Um, as you probably know, entrepreneurs Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy uh, des have been designated to co-head a new Department of Government Efficiency, Doge. Uh, which is uh, 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 sort of convened to enact changes that, that are significant and reduce the government significantly. It's hard to know how that will play out in the cir circumstances of uh, uh, cryptocurrency. They are generally crypto fans and crypto generally wants to be regulated under expanded regulation by the CFTC. So that's one, one variable there. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I mean, I would just want to add that at the top, Donald Trump does not have the capability to fire Gary Gensler um, because that's not how the commission works generally. What he can do is remove him as chair of the SEC, and then he can choose Gensler if he wants to stay on as a normal commissioner as the uh, others are, but there would be a new chair. Um, I think there were reports at the end of last week, uh, maybe on Saturday even, that he Potentially, might uh, Gary Gensler might step down and resign from the SEC um, before the end of the year, but that we'll have to wait to see on that standpoint. But either way, I would expect a change in the chairmanship of, of of the SEC. Now, what I think that brings from a regulatory standpoint, or is a change in the philosophy back to what it normally is. When I was at the New York AG's office, we worked a lot with the SEC and. Typically, the actions that you're seeing brought now against the likes of Coinbase and Binance and, and Kraken and others where they're looking at registration issues were more usually handled through settlement. And they would say, hey, you need to come in and you need to register. Uh, these are these are the things we, we, we expect you to register as and you pay a fine and, and then find a path to, to registration. That's what they did even as recently as with BlockFi. BlockFi was fined $100 million between the SEC and the, the 50 states uh, attorney general's offices. Um, but there was a path to registration. Uh, so I would expect that it goes back to that. And hopefully the SEC gets back to looking at real fraud from a litigation standpoint and looking at how platforms are functioning and are they actually taking advantage of those customers? I think that will be the biggest regulatory change and litigation change coming out of the SEC under new leadership. I'm really glad you said that, Ryan, because I think there's this sort of mistaken idea, idea that um, you can just fire the chair and that there's not this understanding of that the commission is bi bipartisan, the commissioners are a mixture of political parties on purpose and that the, that the chair is supposed to be sort of a first among equals, you know, almost similar to the Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court in that sense. And so it isn't just, you know, as simple as it sounded. I think the, the other thing I really appreciate that, you, you know, kind of you you both have touched on is that is that enforcement doesn't need to isn't going to go completely away it would be but where it will you know presumably focus is on 
actions that are fraudulent and and that we just sort of return to the norm return to you know maybe more of a sort of center more balanced way where the commission is operating in a way that we're 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 more, all more used to it and probably is more healthy it, just my personal opinion on that last one mm. um uh, let me add one thing on 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 leadership i do expect the sec and the cftc chairs to resign in the normal course uh, before inauguration. Mm. And usually there's an interim chair that's appointed for each. The interim chair often is a current commissioner, but doesn't have to be. And then normally the Senate takes a process that can take months. And even last in, in the Biden administration took just about a year for the CFTC, because it tends to be a lower priority than say the Treasury Secretary or Fed Chair. Mm. But normally you have a process where there are hearings in the Senate and, you know, approves uh, nominees. So it can take time to put um, mm -hmm. permanent chairs in place here in the U.S. without going down a rabbit hole. There's some discussion about bypassing that process, but I'll leave that to reports for another Super. day. That's generally how it works. And it, with the SEC, you might see kind of a reversal of policy, uh, even in the interim. Uh, for example, if Commissioner Hester Peirce, who's known as Crypto Mom, and has pro proposed a safe har harbor if she becomes the acting chair. She has some things she can do immediately. For example, she can mm -hmm. withdraw some rules, proposed rules from the agenda. She can withdraw some staff guidance, which is not binding commission guidance like SAB 121. Um, but uh, the CFTC wouldn't as much be reversing course on policy because mm -hmm. it's tended to make sure that it's ready and prepared to take on new jurisdiction it may be given. And there are a few small areas in enforcement and some other other areas generally and, and kind of principally uh, where they there may be some change in course, uh, but not as much as with the SEC with the new chair, I, I it is my sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you, guys. Um, we've we've referred to quite a few different uh areas of policy here and i think it would be helpful to just uh set out uh what the kind of key issues that uh, the crypto industry is awaiting clarification on are so uh, uh it's become kind of old hat now but i think it remains important the definition of securities uh and whether crypto assets or securities or not um, and I guess overlapping with that is the regulator's jurisdiction, uh, you know, whether whether CFTC or, or SEC is going to be supervising these primarily. Brian, you mentioned the having a, a clear path to registration for, for service providers. Uh, and we should definitely talk about uh, SAB 121, the Staff Accounting Bulletin 121, which um, requires... Uh, crypto custody the custody of crypto assets to be treat you have to hold um to be treated as liabilities of the balance sheet so you have to hold an asset against them uh as if it were a normal liability rather than a custody liability which is unique for the crypto industry and uh makes it very very difficult uh for uh banks and other industry other institutions to to provide crypto services much more so than it is uh, in europe uh, for example have I missed anything uh, key there? Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the other the topics that are my, uh, that are sort of the key areas that need clarified? Yeah, I mean, I think top of mind, I, and apologize if you if you mentioned it, but I think uh, stable coins um, mm. is going to be one of the one of the big ones, and could ultimately be the first that comes along in the line of of legislative actions and regular regulatory clarity. Um, I mean. Stable coins, in my mind, are the underpinning uh, of uh, industry writ large, and and I think what people need to start thinking about is how stable coins are going to interact with, you know, the future of real world asset tokenization, and and potentially CBDCs and everything down the line, and not just a mechanism to be able to uh, execute regulatory arbitrage and and be a and trade in a, tra and a trading mechanism there's going to be a world where stable coins are going to be so much more involved in my mind for for the day-to-day -day holder and I th so I think getting that legislation and that regulatory clarity is, is vital um I do think sab 121 is is going to be one of the top of mind things I'll let Suzanne uh uh, discuss that in more detail as she is the the resident uh, accounting expert, but I would say those two are are one of the bigger ones, outside of you know overhaul like of the market structure bill. Yeah, well, Suzanne, let's come to you on on sub one twenty one, and then Dorothy, let's hear from you about what I've what I've missed. 
Sure. And, and uh, Dorothy touched on it. It's, it's a, a SAB 121 is, stands for Staff Accounting Bulletin. It's the staff of the SEC that issue those. They're meant to be interpretive guidance, you know, that helps especially publicly listed companies in the states make sure they're interpreting, you know, the U.S. accounting rules and reporting rules properly. So with that, one really quick historical note is that as far back as 2008, the SEC had its own advisory kind of commission looking at the role of how, how financial reporting rules are made and enforced in the U.S. And one of the big, big, big recommendations from that commission was do not use SABs, overuse them or use them in an overreaching way that creates new accounting and new accounting rules by accident. And so they really cautioned with very strong words. It's paragraph 71, if you want to go look up that report. Um, and, and truly since then, that, is that, then, that has been the case where hardly any staff accounting bulletins have been issued that really kind of create new accounting, so to speak. Now, this, the commission will sort of argue that's not what they've done, but it is really, truly, they did cross over um, the normal accounting rule regulation process in the United States, which is to use the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is a very transparent open, due process ridden, you know, lots of lots of discussion all in the public domain, live stream, video recorded, that that board literally tackles all of these things. And so the questions in that staff accounting bulletin are worthy of discussion, but they should be done in the probably the appropriate way. To, to fast forward then and get off my little sort of history lesson there is it did really put a freeze on the the traditional custodians from hold from custing crypto assets because the nature of the rule and 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 Dorothy touched on it already you know it does make it kind of and you touched on it too Lewis where by having to record a liability in a place where you wouldn't normally have to record one if you're under prudential regulation in the banking industry that has all sorts of knock on effects with the assets you have to hold and it really kept the traditional custodians out of that arena which is one big criticism criticism of it. The other criticism of it was that it did cross some boundaries in terms of being a rule under sort of a U.S. you know regulatory sort of environment where it probably shouldn't have happened the way it happened. Um, and so there's there's arguments about the process, but actually some of the underlying issues in it are worthy of discussion. They just should have should happen in the in the right way. There is every expectation that 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 SAB will be rescinded um, and. <clears throat> tossed out, it could become, the issues in it could become a project of the official Financial Accounting Standards Board, though. And so, that, so that's sort of a wait and see. But everyone expects then the rule to be the, that staff accounting bulletin, which isn't a rule, but was interpreted as a rule by, by most cus traditional custodians and most traditional, anybody that's um, publicly listed, it was interpreted as a rule, even if technically it's meant just to be kind of an, an interpretation of some guidance. But if it goes away, it will bring more traditional custodians to the table, basically, is the punchline. So Yeah. Uh, and just to just to add a little bit of uh context there, there was already uh a talk of uh, you know an opportunity to rescind this guidance that was vetoed by Biden, right? So uh mm -hmm. so I, I, I guess it's a good point. Yeah it, it's yeah it's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I I was gonna say on that I think that would be a if not rescinded by by the SEC itself, and it gets to need, needing a legislative action, I think I think that will be a good uh, first indication to see where Democrats are are lying in their thought of it. Because I mean, you know, it was it did pass both the House and the Senate the first recension of it in in a bipartisan way, in, in a very big bipartisan way. It was that uh, somewhat of a political move, unknown, but it was. It was a chance for for the two parties to come together in, in the Congress. I think if it comes back up and you see as much, if not more, um, more Democratic support to rescind that, I think that will be a good sign generally um, for for future legislation coming out to hopefully be also in a bipartisan manner.
Yeah, yeah, that'd be really interesting to to keep an eye on. Dorothy, let's come to you. Is there anything you want to add on the SAB one twenty one or other key issues that I that I didn't touch on yet? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, my expectation is SAB 121 will be rescinded at the acting or permanent chairman level long before it, it would go to Congress. So just to put it in context, because we have a U.S. and a, and a, and a global audience here, there are five commissioners at the CFTC and five commissioners at the SEC. Like the FCA uh, uh, covers both commodities and securities, we have it broken up. The CFTC cover, has jurisdiction for commodity derivative exchanges, not the spot market yet. Uh, the SEC has jurisdiction for spot and derivatives on securities. Um, so the chairperson can tell a division director without the other four votes, please put out this advisory bulletin that says X. That's what it said. And it's not binding. You cannot be enforced for not following it. But a lot of entities will follow it just to mitigate their risk, especially the listed entities. So I was just trying to double check this. Can my colleagues correct me? Does does Coinbase follow SAB 121 and it's publicly you listed know, I'm, financial I'm, reporting? I'm actually really glad you mentioned you asked that question. Yes, because we've yes. had a lot of focus on the, the official custodians, but the yes. exchangers are also caught up in it, which yes. I'm really glad you mentioned. So, yes. So here's what to watch for. I thought they did, but I just want to make sure before I said it wrong. Here's what to watch for. Before anything is done, because there's just a lot of moving parts between now and the new Congress that starts early January and um, inauguration of the new president, which is January 20th, let, let's see if Coinbase follows SAB 121 for its fourth quarter reporting. reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what I'm going to look for. Um, but in, in any event, it's a non-binding. It doesn't have you know majority vote in by the commissioners. And that's basically you know part and parcel of the big problem. What I would say, I would add to your list, um, your original list um, about what are the issues kind of at hand. You mentioned registration, and you're absolutely right um, to mention registration of entities like exchanges. You know, are they going to register with the CFTC if they trade derivatives? Are they going to register with the CFTC if Congress passes legislation that expands uh, cri crypto non-securities commodities to the CFTC, those are registration issues. And are they going to register with the SEC as broker dealers or exchanges or other types of intermediaries if they're dealing with securities? The second type of registration is an asset itself. So that might be, there's been a lot of back and forth of whether tokens are securities or the way in which they're packaged or securities as investment contracts. But what I wanna say is that in a lot of the dissents at the SEC, the Republicans who will now be in the majority, the Republican commissioners, they have not always said these are definitely not securities. What they've said in my sense is that they believe some of them, not all of them, as the current chair seems to approach the industry, that all of them are securities, mm -hmm. but some of them are. Some of these digital assets are securities. There, need to be, um, there needs to be a mechanism, as Brian said, to register these tokens, to, dis to have disclosures around them. You know, that's key to listing and other, other types of things the SEC oversees and to have some protections around them. So entity registration, asset registration, if they're dealing in securities and then kind of a counterpart without asset registration um, if they're dealing in commodities. And that, I think that's just a key issue. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say, say to the tokens themselves is I don't... <laughs> I don't know if there's a full appreciation out there of the amount of tokens or token like things that would need to be registered under a potential registration issue and how the SEC or the CFT is going to stay on top of all the dozens and dozens, dozens if not hundreds that are created literally every day. I mean, at, at Luca, we have a digital asset classification system and it is tons and tons of man hours to uh, understand, identify, classify each of these individual tokens to figure out what they are and whether they may be a security or not. So it is very, very difficult and time consuming. And I almost think it's bulls Aaron to think that either, um, either, uh, uh, um, agency would be able to stay up to speed on all this and enforce it in a way that is going to protect the market. And really, that's what we need to get back to is protecting the market from fraud. What should be done, in my opinion, is 
rather than having to register every single token, it, they need to expand their 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 fraud divisions and their leg, uh, litigation divisions to be able to keep up with those aspects and handle those cases. Because traditionally, the SEC and the CFTC both are in the settlement business, not necessarily the, the litigation business. Um, so I think you're going to need an expansion of those teams uh, with either one to be able to to keep up with that that portion of it. Yeah, I guess it would be a move to uh, something really principles based that that can be applied Mm-hmm. broadly. And uh, uh, yeah, otherwise, as you say, you'll be looking at uh, hundreds, thousands of tokens on a on a case by case basis. And the given the the market cap of a lot of them, the, there's simply not the 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 need for that. It doesn't make any sense from a resource perspective. I, I imagine. Let me mention that that's the beauty of giving spot jurisdiction to the CFTC. At the the CFTC, the SEC, you have to get SEC approval to list uh, whatever stock or uh, on a on a national securities exchange. The CFTC has a totally different mechanism where you can self certify contracts. Yeah. Contracts are what listed is listed, and I oversaw the division that oversaw all exchanges and all products, and there are tens of thousands of them. There are gazillion crude contracts, Mm -hmm. and some of them have zero volume. And so that mechanism of self-certification, kind of a product-like li- uh, 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 listing that the SEC, that the CFTC doesn't necessarily approve, it can stay if there's a problem, and it can examine the exchanges, and it can, it can examine the principles governing products and particular products if it wants to. And indeed, it does sort of a sampling regularly uh, to make sure. But that's the beauty of giving that jurisdiction to the CFTC is it's sort of designed to handle it. The CFTC is generally very principles based. It doesn't fix. It's not prescriptive. It gives examples of how to comply, which are safe harbors. The CFTC tends to have a much, much more prescriptive and much broader rule set And so that's, you know, kind of what is behind a lot of the impetus and why the industry itself thinks if it is going to need to be regulated, and it it will to some degree for certainly responsible innovation, consumer protection, anti-illicit finance and, 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 and market integrity, why the CFTC's ethos, mission, experience, and kind of approach of disclosures and principles based is, is where they want to be. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Um, Lewis, okay, can I uh, can please I do. ask? Please yeah. Actually, I, can I ask Dorothy and mm-hmm. Brian a question uh, from the panel? Um, so, because you know, in the UK, they don't spend as much time wrapping around the axle of is it a commodity, is it a security? It's about focus on the transactions, and they regulate the transaction and the activity, if you will. And so, my my and that helps in a number of ways, including that a given crypto asset doesn't stay one thing necessarily through its entire life cycle. It has different use cases. And and it makes me wonder, I'm wondering out loud at you, if you both, if then something like the CFTC approach is actually sort of more amenable to the underlying realities as well of how how even a one given crypto asset may behave, it, 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 that it captures sort of all the different sort of permutations it could take all the different sort of economic uses it could take by being sort of almost like you said, focus more on the contracts and if you will, the activities and the transactions and not it is this. Um, although sometimes we need to know it is this, but uh, I don't know if my question is clear, necessarily clear, but. Let me, let me just take a quick stab at that. So I just kind of set out front that I worked for Republican Chairman Heath Tarbert at the CFTC, um, who was appointed by President Trump, and for a Democrat, uh, Ch- current Chair Rustin Bennon, who's appointed by Biden. Um, and so I'm going to try to answer that in a way that's sort of apolitical as much as I can be. Um, there are lots of people who wonder why the heck we have two different financial federal financial trading and markets regulators. Mm-hmm. And it's a not unreasonable question to ask. Um, and that's when I bring up the Doge, Elon Musk, uh, you know, very, very sophisticated people have called me recently to ask whether we think there will be a separate SEC or CFTC or any at all. Mm-hmm. I think those are a little, hopefully those are a little extreme, but you can understand some of the 
ideas behind merging those two organizations. Politically, mm -hmm. it's been impossible because you have a Senate banking committee and a Senate ag committee. And the cynics say yeah. that donations are made to the ag committee and to the banking committee. And you wouldn't want to cut that in half by by combining same in the house. Mm -hmm. But that's a cynical view, but it's been around. And they have different constituencies and, frankly, different purposes. One is for investments and the other is for farmers and airlines to hedge their crops and their air, you know, their fuel costs, different things. So, the, you know, one may query, you know, where this all stands. And I have laughed a couple of times in my own head about whether if those two agencies stay separate, the irony is mm -hmm. we may have crypto to credit for that. Um, mm. uh, which is mm. a you know kind of re Republican responsible innovation, bring all of innovation on shore, compete against Europe, very which I predict to be very successful, and the UK in making sure that innovation will take place, responsible innovation will take place here. Uh, but it, uh, you know, one should query whether those are should stay separate or be combined. Those questions have been around for a really long time, but it's also been a really long time where those questions have been really posed in the, you know, in the face of this Doge commission, who, who knows, we'll have to see. Hmm. Yeah, that is is really interesting to, to think about how that's going to evolve. Um, but Dor well, Brian, maybe you can speak to this. I think Dor Dorothy was, was asking about the sort of slightly mutable nature of crypto assets in the, at different times. And we've seen this in, uh, in the judgments and various uh, SEC cases that a uh, crypto asset is not always uh, the same type of thing. Sometimes it might be a security and sometimes it might be something else. Uh, and maybe the CFTC is is slightly better equipped to handle that kind of uh, that kind of nuance. Yeah, I mean, from from just the the principles based versus the rules based of the mm -hmm. SEC, it, it definitely is. I I think for for myself, I agree with with Dorothy in that it should be a self-certification for these assets i think there's a much there's more greater issues than what an, an, whether an individual token is or is not a security or commodity or what it may become mm -hmm. what it could potentially go back to being um i mean like the sec for a while they're trying to make the argument that that eth was a security then became a commodity but then because it went back to prove a stake it could then be a security again mm -hmm. like these are just arguments that are just made just to to drive their own their own uh, agendas i think if you had a self-certification um policy and and path forward it would just create a lot of clarity and then again getting back to what is probably the more important question of the regulation of where these activities are taking place the registration of those and then looking at you know real fraud and trying to root that out i think if you got beyond the tokens and looked at the activity that's where we need to go and for me it, it definitely is under the cftc mm -hmm. or at least that that idea of self-certification uh this is such a fascinating topic and i'm sure we could go on uh for for a very long time on this but uh aware that uh we shouldn't do that um <laughs> uh so uh, I'm going to ask two more questions uh, and and we can kind of wrap up with those. Uh, the first one, Suzanne, I wanted to come to you on the question of uh, implications for uh, taxation on crypto. Yeah. And then uh, just to give Dorothy and Brian a chance to think about this before I come to them on it. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the international impact and um uh under because of the sec's approach and, and maybe other factors as well we were looking at a crypto market that was kind of bifurcated between the us and the and the rest of the world and i want to uh hear from hear from everyone about uh about if that is going to end or or how we see that uh evolving but before let's talk about um about the tax implications under the new administration for crypto Sure. And, and I'll be really I'll be really brief on this. I won't drag everybody down the tax rabbit hole as much as I love it down there. Um, but right now there are impending changes, some of which are it were meant to take effect January 1st, 2025, around how typical brokers and exchanges do need to issue reports for each of us who is using their exchange to, and to to report back what the proceeds were, you know, kind of the basis of our you know, this thing called the basis for tax purposes that helps sort of figure out what your taxable gain or loss is at the end of the day. And so those are, a, there's a substantial set of changes meant to start and they're, they're sort of staged, but are meant to start January 1st. Um, 
there's there's one thing to mention that is common is that if regulations are sort of in the process and administration changes, there can be a delay in the effective date to give the new administration a chance to decide, do we want to keep these regulations the way they are? Do we want to make any changes? Do we need to go back to Congress and completely change everything and interpret you know, do it a complete kind of overhaul or change. So there is speculation. It's not final. You know, I don't have final word on it or inside, you know, sort of knowledge on it that even the existing regulations that were devised under the Biden administration may the effective date at a minimum may be delayed by a year. So what's supposed to start happening with that reporting Jan 1 may be pushed to Jan 1, 2026. Which opens the door, as you might guess, for could there be a complete change to how crypto taxation operates in the U.S.? And there are rumors about quite, you know, big changes, you know, and, and it is rumor at this point. And so I won't sort of go down the path of the rumor, but there could be substantial changes under the new administration. And that part, we just truly have to wait and see. But a thing that it could ha really happen is a delay in the effective date of the current regulations that are in place. I see. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I would just to, to, to echo that. I would be shocked if uh, you don't see the Trump administration um, delay a lot of what has happened uh, under Biden where they can. Um, it just his mo. I think he did a lot of that last time too. Um, so I, I would imagine that that would happen again. But um, stranger things have happened. I mean, it's something you know, like Brian pointed. Out, that, you know, this is what Luca does. You know, day in and day out, we think about tax and accounting for these things, and we can we handle it all. And so, but we're watching this very very closely, which is why we're we're you know super aware of the chance that this could be effectively you know, effective date could be delayed. So. Yeah, it'd be very interesting uh, to see. Uh, I guess there'll be some. Um, well, it's a very politicized issue on the on the tax front, um, right? I want to come to the final question on the uh, the international landscape because, like I say, the, this idea of a sort of bifurcated world of the U.S. and the rest of the world um, seems pretty detrimental to the the U.S. crypto industry, and uh, I wonder uh, if you see that changing. I do. Um, so one of the reasons I left the CFTC, one of the reasons I left Coinbase to go to the CFTC is to help move forward a path to responsible innovation. Um, and we made some change, you know, internally and, you know, there's some incremental progress there. One of the reasons after I left the CFTC to go in the Senate for just a, 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 a six month stint was to do exactly the same thing. And it was hard mm -hmm. to get, particularly in the Senate, Democratic support, but one of the things that everyone agreed on, well, there were a couple of things. One is to national security to prevent illicit finance. And the second thing that on a bipartisan basis that everyone agreed on was we want innovation here in the U.S. I remember receiving a call from a huge endowment um, saying overseas saying we want the we lost a hundred gazillion dollars in uh, FTX, but we want everything in the U.S. We want the private equity in the U.S., we want registration at the CFTC or SEC in the U.S. We want bankruptcy in the U.S. Um, we want it from beginning, mm -hmm. you know, beginning to end in the U.S. because we trust the process. And I just hope the Doge Committee listens to that a little bit, because if you, you know, take it to its logical extreme and take all that regulation away, even the effective regulation that protects investors and consumers mm -hmm. and, and, and supports responsible innovation, then you might limit that. Um, you know, my hope is that uh, the focus will be on uh, back to the basics, um, streamlining, um, and uh, uh, a focus on responsible innovation. And I think with that, um, you will have innovation coming back on shore in droves. And everyone mm -hmm. on a bipartisan basis agrees with that. I just want to add mm -hmm. one thing. I was at a speech about a week ago when one of the CFTC commissioners, Summer Mersinger, spoke about enforcement. And in effect, she said, let's stop with the statistics and let's focus on the risk. She also says, let's stop with being regulation by enforcement. Let's focus on rules and, and fairness. She's a terrific uh, a person and commissioner and policy thought leader. 
And one of the things she said is instead of appointing, you know, having these huge, massive fines, why don't we have independent validators who companies hire when they're looking at potential enforcement or even before to, to avoid it? Um, and if they've gone that far, why don't we give them credit for it? Like they've been bad actors or not perfect actors. They brought in external credible people to validate and fix it. They've told us about it because we either knocked on their door or they came to us. Then they should be fine or have, you know, no, if any, fine, low, if any fines. And I want to just mention that real quick because I think that's an additional area where this may go. I also, because it's self-serving and that's the work that I do. So a shameless plug for the work that we do, but I wanted to also mention that that's something coming up. No, it's good to hear about. It. I mean, it's a very important, uh, a very important function that is going to be in, uh, needed. I guess. Yep. Sorry, Brian, you were going to say. Oh no, I, I was just going to say, I agree with Dorothy. I think the U.S.'s uh, chances now to to make that impact, and and mm-hmm. I I left the New York Attorney General's office to join the private sector in order to be able to reach more regulators, and to also be have the mind of like understanding what not just like state attorney generals are looking at, but also the SC, my work with the SEC and the, and the CFTC and other regulatory agencies. And it's a different mindset. And, and I get that. And, and I think global regulators understand that too, but I also believe in the industry and I think they're, the future is there. So, so once the U S opens up and, and leads mm-hmm. the way, um, and I think they have a very good chance to kind of make some changes in how they regulate. And, you know, I, I, one of the beauties of, of the digital asset industry is the vertical integration of it, the reduction of costs that it brings. That mm-hmm. needs to stay put. Like if we just split everything up like we have with with traditional finance, we're losing all of the cap or a lot of the capabilities of what this industry brings and what blockchain really brings. And we always need to continue to remember that when we're building new legislation. And if the U S does that correctly, we're going to see, and I mean, I think we see it either way, but we're going to see droves of companies coming here, other regulators following our path, even if they already have their Mm -hmm. own um, regulatory frameworks in place, but we can really be, as Trump said, the crypto capital of the world. And it's not going to take, um a ton we just need to get on the same page and and thankfully um whether you agree or disagree with like the broader picture having a unified government for our industry right now is probably the best thing that is going to have that has happened for the industry in a long time yeah totally agree i think uh it'll be very interesting uh, to see how this all shakes out. But uh, sadly, we're going to have to leave it there, I think, uh, guys. Um, really fascinating discussion. Much more to be discussed. We didn't even get to the Bitcoin stockpile question, but uh, we'll just have to have another one of these uh, coming up. Um, so uh, what's the space? Uh, I'm sure we'll have more of these chats uh, in the future as uh, as we get a little bit more clarity on, on uh, some of the points that, that we've raised today. But I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, do follow us on social media. We're on uh, LinkedIn and uh, what I will still try to call Twitter, but uh, <laughs> given, mm-hmm. given Musk's new role in federal government and I don't want to be extradited, I should probably call X. Um, <laughs> uh, and check out our website on org for news of our upcoming reports, events, commentaries, uh, including one from Dorothy, uh, which is already up there, I believe, um, on this topic. So... Uh, Yeah, um, watch this space for more. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.